Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. America's fleet of nuclear submarines represents the most tactical projection of naval power exhibited by any single nation. These attacking machines offer the much needed stealth, flexibility, and accuracy in neutralizing air, land, and sea targets under cover of the deep blue seas. Despite the long core life that permits submarines to go for over 20 years without refueling, these powerful war machines have one major shortcoming. They can only carry up to 120 days worth of food for the crew on board. They require regular resupply. Replenishing a submarine is usually done by the submarine pulling into port or receiving at sea replenishment from a surface ship. A slow process that can take weeks to plan and execute. In its search for faster, cheaper, and more effective replenishment alternatives for forward-based submarines, the U.S. Navy achieved a historic milestone in October 2020. A nuclear submarine was resupplied by air during four-day testing around the Hawaiian Islands. The vessel in question was the Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine USS Henry M. Jackson. The aircraft came from three different military branches, U.S. Navy MH-60R Seahawk helicopters, U.S. Marine MV-22 Ospreys, and U.S. Air Force C-17 Globemaster III. Despite its extensive experience, the C-17 was a newbie in the area of maritime vessel resupply. Since its maiden flight in 1991, the C-17 Globemaster has been an undisputed frontrunner, flying numerous troop insertion sorties for the U.S. Air Force, in addition to tactical and strategic airlift missions to operating bases around the globe. With just over a 170,000 pound payload capacity, the aircraft has broken the records for oversized payloads 22 times. And in 1994, it was honored with U.S. Aviation's most prestigious award, known as the Collier Trophy. of this bulky plane to land on narrow airstrips and unpaved runways has led to greater efficiency and the achievement of rapid turnaround times on numerous missions. Loading the C-17 Globemaster for resupply missions is usually a difficult task but made less strenuous by its advanced configurations. The floor of its massive 88-foot cargo compartment is fitted with rollers to facilitate the loading of palletized cargo. The floor can also be flipped over, 
presenting a flat surface to accommodate massive rolling stock, like the 70-ton M1 Abrams main battle tank, helicopters, and even the U.S. presidential motorcade. However, for its first ever assignment to resupply a submarine at sea, this particular C-17 will be flying from the 535th Airlift Squadron Base in Hawaii. The loadmaster opens the main cargo door, and two airmen bring the package into the compartment. As the door closes, the package is positioned on the rollered floor. Final instructions and coordinates are received, and the plane is airborne. The pilot locates the submarine, and at the perfect speed, altitude, and position, the cargo is pushed through the door, just a short distance from the waiting submarine. The parachute ensures that the waterproof sealed package makes a gentle landing on the water surface to avoid any damage. Inside the submarine itself, the fresh food supplies are properly stored and rationed until the next supply is due. For the officers and men sharing this tubular underwater home, routine life is quite different from the rest of us living above sea level. On this Virginia-class USS Minnesota, for instance, the 134 crew members, like other submariners, work on a unique 18-hour routine, divided into three shifts and interspersed with meal times. Six hours on watch duty, six hours for training and maintenance duties, and six hours to relax, work out in the gym, or study. Though aerial supplies may be rare to submariners, it is a regular fixture to paratroopers training in the freezing Arctic region. Due to the environment, bulk military equipment and food resupply must be delivered by airdropping. This is particularly applicable for important training like Operation Spartan Pegasus. During this exercise, soldiers and airmen from U.S. Army Alaska, the U.S. Air Force, and the Alaska Army National Guard brave the sub-zero temperatures to carry out military exercises that will build and enhance their mobility and survivability skills in this and other similar cold weather locations. The training usually begins with heavy cargo dropping from a U.S. Air Force C-17 Globemaster III. It lands in the designated drop zone in Dead Horse, Northern Alaska. As the aircraft approaches the drop zone, the rear door opens. First, the static line is released to deploy the parachute attached to the heavy pallet. 
As the open parachute gathers air in the powerful windstream at the tail of the aircraft, it exerts pressure on the pallet through the solid cord, forcing it to roll out into the open air. The 10,000-pound small unit support vehicle and other heavier deliveries will require multiple parachutes to control ground impact. Cargo dropping is closely followed by parachuting participating soldiers. These soldiers are adequately equipped to face brutal temperatures. They set up camp, settle in, and prepare for the grueling excitement ahead. The Small Utility Support Vehicle, or SUSB, is used for limited distance ground mobility. At the same time, the two UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters brought in by the Alaska Army National Guard will assist in air mobility for the duration of the exercise. Not far from this location lies the Donnelly Training Area, which covers a sprawling 624,000 acres of freezing land. This is the theater for yet another important U.S. military paratroopers training operation. The Arctic Warrior mission, as it's called, also begins with intensive airdropping on the first day. Another formation of the same planes brings in the paratroopers, known as the Spartan Brigade. As soon as they touch down, they prepare their weapons against any eventualities, wrap up their parachutes, and set up camp. During this swift response exercise, which takes place every year around Eastern Europe, the Arctic High North, the Baltic, and the Balkans, paratroopers are properly drilled on the use of powerful snowmobiles to evacuate mock casualties. For multiple casualties, skids with narrow ski-like runners are attached to the snowmobiles and pulled along. When it comes to saving the lives of downed military personnel, the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare Pararescue Men stand out as the bravest. These expert paratroopers are trained to penetrate hostile and unreachable environments to rescue and medically assist soldiers in need. Their search and rescue capabilities extend from the sea to the mountains, the forests, and even the freezing polar regions. They jump from planes into these places, carrying everything they will need inside their heavy rucksacks. Nevertheless, slinging heavy bags may not be nearly as difficult as becoming a paratrooper in the first place. From the basic 28-week-long combat infantry men's course to the more advanced modules, Trainees are meticulously schooled in every aspect of the real-life paratrooper role, starting with mock-up indoor skydives and aircraft exit rehearsals under the watchful eyes of a jump master.
Years later, these trainees will become expert paratroopers handling important resupply missions, Arctic rescue operations, and the life-saving pararescue duties for which the U.S. Air Force is admired globally. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.